this particular point in time, we're going to uh, entertain um, questions. Uh, I might point out that you know, the question that I'm about to read is not one that is generated by me. But this one is specifically directed to Mr. Shepard. Mr. Shepard, to quote you, you have said a police accountability process should be complete, thorough, fair, and impartial. Everyone would agree with these general statements. Very specifically, what concrete elements are you proposing? And could you please give examples? When I first came on the Rochester Police Department, the police accountability process was basically two police officers, a command staff, and one civilian. Over a number of years, that changed so that it was two civilians and one police command officer. And then the current way of looking at it is three civilians, a civilian review board. They're in the Rochester Police Department, Internal Affairs, they do the investigation, and then the civilian review board reviews it, and then it comes back to the police department, and at the end it's up to the chief to either agree with the findings and to make the recommended penalty. Obviously, with the way we are in the nation today, we're seeing the need for changes in our case. And I'm not against change. I'm not against having other people do the investigation. I'm not against having other people make determination in terms of how that penalty should be handed down. But what is important here is that when that investigation starts, you have not reached a conclusion in terms of outcome. Because whether you're a police officer or a person of color, that is the thing that we have suffered within this country. The predetermined outcomes. So for me, if I was a police officer, whether it's you, a relative of yours, somebody who's appointed by City Hall, as long as that investigation is complete and thorough, when I say complete and thorough, you don't leave any stones unturned. When I say fair and impartial, at the end of the day, if I did wrong, I know I did wrong, whether I want to acknowledge it or not. If I'm guilty and you find me guilty, I'm willing to accept that. What I cannot, I mean, will not accept, if I know I didn't do it, but because you think I did it, or because you want to make me guilty, that's the conclusion you reach. And I know that there's proposals on the table for investigation to be done by an independent board. And that is fine with me. But at the end of the day, complete, thorough, fair, and impartial. Um, allow any of the uh, candidates to respond in any kind of rebuttal if they would like? That is a great idea. Shepard nailed it. You did. Yeah. We have three minutes. If only it was that these investigations by PSS started without a predetermined conclusion. Unfortunately, they don't. They start out with a conclusion that police officers did okay. Yeah. Everything was fine, they followed the rules, and that's what we're facing. I've been fighting against this for years. And you look at the evidence, 2%, the 2% of the complaints are, are upheld. We have many cases that have gone to court. We have many times someone's been arrested, and they've had a trial. And it's been common. The crime determined the person was innocent. But yet the officer doesn't get reprimanded. We have a situation and have for years, and a pre-date show uh, 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 when uh, Mr. Shepard was chief, but it continued through his reign, in which people are being arrested for resisting arrest. And then other charges are being added on to make it look like they're not being arrested for resisting. If there's no valid reason to arrest you, you can't be arrested, you can't resist it. Our police, in many cases, know they can get away with anything. And I have stand in as an independent observer at PSS investigations, and I have listened to the questions they have asked. And what I have heard is them ask, why were you there? They asked, what were you doing before that? They're looking for crimes the person had committed to discredit them. In many cases, they ask no questions 
about the officers or the incident involved. And the one thing I know for sure is that if you're not looking, you're certainly not going to find it. <laughs> and the records we have from the last 15 years published in the studies demonstrate clearly we're not looking and we're not finding it. And so we need to revamp this. And the people who have supported this and have put it in place and have stood by it now for 20 years are not the people that are going to fix this. And the recommendation in the report done by Ted Forsyth and Barbara uh, Lackaware should be where we end up in the discussion. It's fair, it's balanced, it's taken from other cities where it works, and it's what we should be looking at. And that's the police accountability board. Thank you. My way of handling this would be something that I would do as mayor, and that's create a rotating civilian advisory board. That would come from all the different uh, neighborhood groups. And I would take one or two of them. I would use some clergy. I would ask, uh, you know, a judge, maybe a retired judge, someone with legal experience, to man this so there's representation across the board. Because when you look, think about it, if you come across a bad mechanic, a bad realtor, uh, maybe a, a doctor that's not so great, it's going to happen. I don't think there's anybody. I don't think anybody as an officer has the intention to do something wrong. At least I'd like to think that. So this would be kind of a check and balance. And then drawn from the community, drawn from clergy, drawn from law enforcement, drawn from the judicial, you're able to cover all the bases and get everybody's voices heard. I think that's a logical way of handling it. Thank you. Mr. Shepard from some interview said that if it comes down to a police officer's account, the police officer will be the lead. Police officers are people too. And it doesn't seem as though we want to recognize that. We don't want to recognize the fact that they have emotions, that they have attitudes, that they have beliefs, but they do. And sometimes those attitudes and emotions and beliefs are not in the best interest of our community. I have also endorsed the police accountability board. I also believe that it's not stringent enough. Because when we do have an officer that has been accused of a violent act against a citizen, they are suspended with pay. That's a vacation. That's still coming out of the taxpayers' years pocket. Possibly, if they are suspended without pay, they will think twice before committing a violent act against the civilian. Possibly, if they know that their words are going to be taken over a citizen, they will think twice against creating a violent act against the citizen. Especially now in the light of technology, where people are beginning to videotape these incidents, and they are shown to be negligent. So we have to come together as a community and work to not only change the attitude of the police, but work to change our attitude so that we can create a community of respect between the two. But that can only be done in an open, honest, transparent administration that looks for the truth, that looks for righteousness, that looks for respect from all individuals. Thank you. I said from the beginning when this lack of wear force of I spent 18 years finding the truth, and that will never, ever change. The James Shepard and Love Award have absolutely zero credibility on this issue. Let me start with Jim Shepard. During his time as police chief, he didn't find anyone guilty of using excessive force in these cases that went before him. And that's according to a Democratic Chronicle report. That's how much he cared about finding justice. And if you listen to his words just now, here's a guy who's on the record saying he doesn't support the Black Lives Matter movement. His quote
quote was, Black Lives Matter, show me. All lives matter. And that was very obvious of what he said. He didn't say he wanted reform because it's the right thing to do. He said he wanted reform because one of the right ones. Okay. <laughs> this is a man who went in a deposition when a guy was ticked out of his wheelchair. He was asked if that standard procedure to arrest someone. He said, well, it depends on who is this is someone who said, you punch me in my face, I'm punching you in yours. This is someone who goes on the radio and jokes about beating people up. He has a long history of talking about the use of force in terms of winning and losing and good guys and bad guys. We know everything we need to know about James Shepard and his leadership. He should never be in charge of the police department again. Well, that may be so. Okay, well, so, we're, 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 so that, that's a different situation. 
So let's be, let's, let's be, let's understand something. When you have a lawsuit going on against the city, then the mayor cannot get involved in it because it's now a legal matter. And therefore, it will be a conflict of interest for me to have a discussion with you about your attorney. Okay, thank you. Now, what did you say your name? My name is Phyllis Harmon. Okay, Phyllis, I will have to ask you to do your follow-up. Okay, uh, thank you. Mayor uh, the first question is uh, directed to, to you, Governor uh, Warner. Uh, your views on the uh, call for the reform to the present civilian review board. Uh, do you support the call for reform? And how would you change the present system? And then uh, to Rachel Barnhart, uh, how would you change the present review board? How would you change the system? We're going to start with uh, Mohamed Warren and then to Rachel. Thank you, Mohamed, for that question. So let me be clear. Um, when I was on city council, we did a review of the civilian review process, and we changed, we did a number of things to change it. Um, one of them was bringing forth an advocate to walk in and go in with the complainant so that they could, um, because one of the complaints was that people were feeling like they were being I'm an advocate and making sure that that person could go into the room with the complainant, be able to stop any questions that were uh, not needed. And we heard nothing about that process for a long period of time. We had a situation where now this issue has come up again and we're taking a look at it. And I think that that's what government does. That when there's an issue that arises and you see something that is not working, look at it, you analyze it, and then you do something different. So I'm not above changing the system. I support it city council because they are the ones that ultimately set policy. Unfortunately, some people up here don't understand who sets policy. Okay? Other thing about it is listen to what people say when you're in the room and what they say when you're out of the room. Because many of the people up here when we were just at the police uh, locust club, the stuff that they're talking about today, none of them, many of them, didn't say that to them. So you want people that are going to say what they need to say to their face, as well as behind your back. Now, I am a person that will stand on truth, and stand up for the people of our community and our city when it is needed. But there's one thing that's clearly, we have a system where you're going to have a police department where you're going to have a community. We have to figure out a way where both of us are able to function respectfully with one another. That is the one thing that needs to happen, respect on both sides, okay? I'm not gonna say that the police department is above reproach. They don't need um, changes because they do, they do too have issues. We've seen some of that. But there are some other things that we also need to handle and to talk about. Because this is going to be a city that has a police department and a city that has a community. And so for me, my whole focus as mayor has been to build relationships. It's the reason why we do clergy on patrol, going door to door with our clergy, asking our community to understand what our police department is facing, as well as alongside our clergy. It's the reason why we do our books and bears program where we give officers books and bears they hang out the children when they go in and they see that they're in a situation that they can't, that, that, that is uh, hurtful to them. It's the reason why we go out and we do different community events all the time to try and build that relationship. What is that? This relationship is not broken in three and a half years. It was a relationship that was broken over time and that we tried many times to continue to repair. But I can tell you that we're better off today than we were three and a half years ago. But the most important thing that I want everyone in this room to understand is pay attention to what people say behind your back. When they're in the room with other folks, other folks that may not agree with the position of the people that's in this room, and listen to what they say, and hold them accountable when they do that. I was at that meeting Monday night and I looked at all the police officers in the audience and told them we need a police accountability board. We need one with an independent investigator. We need one where the chief is 
not the final arbiter of these complaints. So the mayor does set policy because the mayor hires and fires the police chief. The mayor can submit legislation to city council and lead on the issue and get enough support on council to get something passed. There's also an internal discipline process with the police department. The mayor can work with the police chief and work with the police union to negotiate what that looks like. Trust is broken. Public Warren's 90-day report on police community relationships was taxpayer-funded propaganda. It stopped short of calling for a report of the civilian review board process. And it didn't paint a picture that we hear over and over and over again that what I hear when I talk to people at the doors every night. I had a high school classmate contact me saying she wants to sign the guard because she's uh, very concerned about her sons right now when they go out on the street and have interactions with police. We can't have that. We have to rebuild trust because it makes you safer, it makes officers safer, and it's better for our community. So I do support this kind of little board. I support the concept of it. I like a lot of the recommendations that Barbara Lyon-Ware and Ted Sports have made. Not all of them, but I think it's the direction we have to go in. We will need uh, community input, we'll need input from all stakeholders about what that will look like. Because the current system isn't working and trust is broken. Thank you.
almost 50% of the total donations taken by all of us up here come from those builders, and almost all of it went to one person. Now, do we wonder why we give them money? We keep electing the person who gets the money from them. The next thing we need to do is we need to get more people working. We need job training, and unfortunately, one of the best programs that does that is something called Oasis. And Oasis has had its funding cut by almost 40% in the last three years. They provide vocational education to give people careers, not just jobs. We need to focus on the training and education that will give the jobs to the people. And then we need to look at the fact that the economy is changing and we need to make workers into owners by doing co-ops so that as technology increases and jobs vanish, the benefits of the improved mechanization will be seen by the workers who will still be receiving uh, uh, adequate compensation because they own the company and are getting a share of the increased profits. Co-ops are pretty much the only thing I see as our solution. And we just decided to let Uber in. And Uber is committed to eliminating drivers. And Uber is also going to kill our taxi cab industry. This is the opposite direction we need to go. One of the first things I would do is I would try to find a way to, to force unionization on all drivers in the city through some sort of ordinance. I would try to, I would try to find ways in, in which to, in which to uh, turn the drivers into owners and have them get the benefits when the drivers are in. 20 seconds. And that's an example of how to approach this. I have a lot on my website about this. You can look it up at alexwhiteforrochester.org. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. White. Thank you, Mr. White. Mr. Mr. I am very distressed over the fact that none of the current candidates for the office of mayor has dared to address the issue of the physical and sexual abuse of children. Child abuse is the major crime of our society. One out of four little girls will fall victim to this hideous crime. One out of six little boys will fall victim to the same crime. Several years ago, Mayor Robert W. promised a group of clergy that he would place in motion some kind of program to deal directly with those who abuse children for the prevention of it and for the salvation of our little ones. He failed to do that. He never even attempted to approach it. I'm asking all of you now who are vying for this very critical office what would you do to help to stymie this attack upon the most vulnerable population that we have, our children? Over 40,000 cases a year of child abuse are reported to Monroe County. CPS can handle the load. Nobody can handle the load. I feel it is my recommendation to whoever whoever wins the office of mayor, that you immediately appoint a task force on child abuse to deal with this terrible, terrible one. And as each of you will briefly address this issue, I'll take my seat. And I thank you.
community counselors at the elementary level. They need help at the elementary level. They need to feel safe at the elementary and secondary level. Not, not just the elementary level, but we must begin there. Right now, uh, there are very few counselors at the elementary level. When I left, I'm an elementary teacher, a former elementary teacher. And these children aren't getting the counseling they need, they're not getting the help that they need. They don't feel comfortable in saying, I was abused to anyone in that situation because very few adults in that situation will help them. So we need to open up an avenue for these children to feel safe in school because that's what they are a great deal of time. And I'm willing as mayor to work with anyone who wants to create a system of solutions that deal with that problem. I saw it a, a lot and it was very little for me to do because when you report it as a teacher to CPS, they take the child out of the home six months later, if this is happening in the home, six months later the child is right back. Or the child is placed in the home for their abuse there. So the solution is not easy. The situation, the problem is immense. But it has to start where the children go to school and are comfortable with talking to the teachers because if they know that something will actually be done and they won't be vilified for coming forth. And I'm willing to work with you, sir, on this problem. Thank you. Please remember now that I've asked the question, what would you do as mayor in order to prevent these evils? And also, would you be agreeable to composing a task force on child abuse with the authoritative power to make decisions relevant to the safety of our children? The best way to prevent the problem is to recognize it and to identify it. And again, that's through making children comfortable enough to come forward in an educational setting. Because outside of that educational setting, they are being abused. Once they're in school, they feel comfortable enough to go to a church administrator and say, I was abused. Then we can address the problem through a task force. And until we get them to admit or to come forward about the issues, there's really very little we can do. Thank you, Lord. I'm a committed perspective. Fifty years ago, when I was in a post home for the first time, um, it's a temporary home. So they place you in a, in a permit. And I remember a young lady, a young little girl, nine years old, and I still remember her name, Darlene. And all she did was cower under the stairs. She wouldn't, wouldn't eat, wouldn't do anything, she just sat there and cried. And me being an eight-year-old, nine-year-old boy, I asked, what's wrong? And all she said was, he hurt me, he hurt me. That stuck with me all my life. When I found out the New York State did not have Jessica's Law, named after a young little girl that was killed down in Florida, this lady's not in her head, she knows. I wrote a memorializing resolution to push the state of New York, the Assembly of the Senate, to pass it to protect the girls. I think it's, what this gentleman is suggesting is a good idea. Why not a joint venture between maybe the county and the city? And try to look at what the causes are and I think part of it might be that parole officers need some help too. They can't manage all these people. I'm actually talking to one of my fellow legislators right now on the very issue and trying to get more money for CPS. I think it's a great idea that you come up with. Thank you. Dr. Walker, I agree with you on the fact that our children are most vulnerable and we need to make sure that we're doing everything in our power to protect them. Um, I don't have a problem with the task force. Actually, I'll talk about what I have done on this very issue. A couple of years ago when I was on city council, there was actually a teacher who had, uh, was accused of abusing uh, a child and was still um, in the school setting. Uh, joined with, at the time, Howard Eagle and, and many others in the community. 
uh, to not only talk to the school board, but also sign petitions and ask that that teacher be removed. Um, I believe in standing up for our children. Also, I've been working very closely with the Bologna Child Advocacy Group. One of the things that we have done um, that was an issue was that children would have to go to the DA's office, they would have to go to the police office, they would have to go to social workers, all these different places in order to tell their story. Um, we were able to get Bologna the support and have police officers in the DA's office and everyone right there on site at Bologna where the child can tell the story one time to a counselor that can help them. Um, and help their family and get their resources right there. We actually have officers that are at that site and not at the public safety building um, there at Pomona. That's something that has happened in the last couple of years. I'm not sure uh, Pomona started about, I believe, about six years ago, but over time it's changed. Um, another thing that we have done, and I have been talking to the county executive about support for child protective services. Now you have two county legislators here. Child Protective Services is under their purview. You've heard many of the, the counselors and the CPS workers talk about not having enough CPS workers, not having enough money, having a large caseload, and not being able to service the community the way that they know the community needs to be serviced. Have you heard from them too? They've been silent on this issue. And I think that it's very, very important that this issue that the CPS workers have raised to come to the forefront and for the money to be allocated and for someone to push the issue. Now, we have Tony Michigan here, so I expect that he will be putting forth legislation to do that. And I hope that Mr. Shepard will sign out that legislation so that we can get the CPS workers the support that they need to take care of our families and take care of their children. Uh, I just want to also uh, point out, we have a third legislator here, Mr. John Lightfoot. That's all. And I would commend Mr. Lightfoot because Mr. Lightfoot, Mr. Flagler, Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Lachey here, and also I believe it was them three that sent, letters, sent a letter to the county executive asking for a task force to be put in place asking for support for CPS, asking for the county executive to put forth a real plan on how to deal with this issue that CPS workers have been calling for. I didn't see your name on there, and I definitely didn't see Mr. Shepard's name on there. You're right, I'm on it. I know you're on it, so I commend you for that. Thank you. Um, I'll keep it brief. Dr. Walker, you're right. We should get all of the part. This uh, problem has many facets and many groups that work on it. We need to get them all together, like we've done with many other problems in our city, and have all the people involved work together to try to come up with better solutions. And as mayor, I would look forward to try to put that together and to try to get all of the county it's uh, all of the county agencies on board as well. First off, Brother Walker, I want to acknowledge your passion on this subject. As you know, we have worked in a number of uh, opportunities to try to move this thing forward. I'm on the board at the moment. I was on the board for six years. During my time on the board of the owner and as the chief police chief, I initiated that move for the police officers not being in the police headquarters and working out of the board offices for the very same reasons that the mayor stated it should be done. In terms of the task force, I think the most important thing to do is have that opportunity to listen to the community to hear those recommendations and then make it happen. One of the things I take great pride in is I'm not going to stand up here and tell you I have all the answers. Because what's important to me is to listen to you, to hear your thoughts, get your ideas, and then move that agenda forward. In terms of CBS, and we know, the Democratic Caucus knows that there's a shortage of CPS workers. 
I have walked with CPS workers in the front of the county office building and advocated for raises, advocated for increased staff, and we have presented legislation or letters to the county executive to make that happen. Thank you. I, as you know, I'm a very strong supporter of removing the statute of limitations for um, child sex abuse in New York State. I think that's a very important measure as well. If there are any gaps that need to be filled, working with our police department, Corona, and the DA, I'm absolutely willing to do that and be part of the task force. Thank you, Rachel. State your name and your question. I'm Bob Bachman. This yes or no question is asked by the Edward Nelson on connections radio show. Do you think that in our community there's a problem of civilians not being heard when making complaints of use of force by police? Yes or no? Yes. I would think part of the issue is, I know it's a yes or no answer, but I, I just want to state the fact that uh, more important than being heard, obviously, is to be heard and for something to come from that conversation. Um, so to say yes, they are heard, um, and there's no uh, follow-up or no investigation, doesn't serve the community at all. Was that yes or no? <laughs> the question was, the question was, do you think that in our community there is a problem of, civil, of civilians being heard when not being heard when making complaints of use of force by police? Yes or no? And I think the issue is that they are heard, but they don't get the result that they'd like to see. That, Evan Dawson asked yes or no. That's his question. Yes or no? Yes. Thank you. Sir? Yeah, the older name. Being a man is not in charge of the school. What can a man do to improve education in our city and about you? Thank you, Pastor Capri. I'll talk about what I, what I have done, and I think that um, just because you're not in charge of the school doesn't mean that you can't effectuate change when it comes down to the school district. And when I talked about earlier about increasing pre-K enrollment by 1,200%, we continue to do that. We also continue to invest in our libraries and our recreation centers so that we can provide support to children and families after school and in the summertime provide opportunities. Um, one of the things that we have done is made our recreation centers not just about play, but we have many different programs that we have started, like STEM, as well as art, as well as sports programs, so that our children understand that it's not just about play when coming to the city rec. We also provide um, education, no opportunities for them after school, for them to be able to um, meet with someone and help them with their homework. I also believe that working with the superintendent of schools, and as I said in the beginning, I've had four superintendents in three and a half years. I truly believe that working with the new superintendent, Barbara Lee Williams, that will be able to make some changes, and we have. One of the things that we have talked about, and I meet with her on a regular basis, is about community schools. Uh, finally, the Board, of, uh, the Board of Education elected to have school number 17 and school number 33 um, become community schools, and are looking at other options as well. So, are we where we need to be? Graduation rates have gone up, but they're not where we want them to be. But I believe that the first thing that we can do is provide stability to the district. And having a superintendent that's consistent is the one thing. And that's why working with our a superintendent, Barbara Lee Williams, I believe that we can be able to do that. But in my little house, libraries and recreation centers, I not only provided more money, support, and staff, we continue to provide opportunities for our children after school, not only to work, but also to come there and get educational opportunities. We work with the Rochester Anti-Poverty Initiative to secure additional dollars for not only childcare, but also for, um, for preschool. 
to our family. Thank you. Sending our children to a system of education that normalizes, standardizes, and dehumanizes them is not a solution. We need to work together to change the system of education so it actually educates our children. Yeah. And the way to do that is to increase home ownership for citizens in Rochester so that we can come out from under the control of the big five. Citizens in Rochester don't have any control over the budget which was just approved at over a billion dollars. Citizens in Rochester cannot vote on any kind of policy or procedure for the city school district. Our city school commissioners are paid and not volunteer like they are in the suburbs. And anything that we do to say no as a community can be ignored and has been ignored. We need to understand that as a community, we have to come together and save our children. I have a website called Save Our Children because they are not being properly educated. They are not being uh, given the opportunity to receive an excellent education. Rochester, New York classifies 17% more children as disabled to get special ed and they get special ed, not to get special ed money, but they do get extra money for those classified children. 17% more than any other school district in New York State. That's unconscionable. Our children are gifted and talented. All children are gifted and talented. And until we change our system of education in our community to show the gifted and talented children that we have, nothing else is going to matter because they're still being Standardized, normalized, and dehumanized. Thank you. Too many of the kids in our district don't see education as having any value whatsoever. They know someone who graduated who was really smart and went to MCC way smarter than they are, and they don't have a job. The number one employer of kids in our city are gangs and drugs. These are the jobs they look at, these are the people they see doing well, and they want to emulate them. We have been cutting our, our summer of opportunity for people so that fewer and fewer kids have a chance to get a job outside of illegal trades. And so what do we expect? They go to the illegal trades, they get sucked in, they end up having a record, it becomes harder, they don't graduate from school, it goes on and on. I feel the first thing the city can do is a provide a job to every kid who grad passes their grade in high school for this summer. 10 hours, a, 20 hours a week, 10 weeks over the summer, and if they manage to keep that job all summer, we, I think the city should pay them $10 every week that they attend every day in school and don't get in trouble. This sort of pay for grade is kind of controversial, but it does have some success in a couple other cities, and I think that it's time that we give it a shot. The business owners that I've spoken to across the city love the idea of the city working to help them find and obtain workers and we'd be happy to participate in a program like this, cutting the costs. And many of them might even find a way to keep the kid working through the school year because these are creative people. And once the students of our district realize that jobs and hard work are a better option, then we will have more graduation. But until then, the only people graduating are the athletes who have to. And that needs to change. Thanks. Think of our schools. So kids are successful and achieve. Is the civil rights issue over our time? Our kids matter. If you can go on the internet, Go we'll back to channel 10, I see 10 is here tonight. To Berkeley Green, 
He put out an expose in 2015, today, on how bad the schools were. We're number 432 out of 432. We are the worst school district in the state. Second worst in the country behind Detroit. I think that calls for drastic matters. So I try to think outside the box and think, how can I motivate the school district to restructure? And what is the biggest motivator? Money. The mayor is mandated, it's called Mo, maintenance of effort, to take $119 million and give to a school district that's a total failure. Why am I going to pay for failure? I'm not. So I figured out a way to live with the mandate, but put pressure on the school district to pull their head out of their back pocket. How's that for cleaning it up? <laughs> <laughs> and keep the money in escrow. We have a 45% graduation rate, and that's with social promotion. I'm telling them, you have to graduate 65%, and that means you're still losing one out of three. But that's better than losing 55% of them. I'll hold the money in escrow, and let me know when you achieve that benchmark. That's just one of my many ideas on this. Um, transparency. So many candidates talk about transparency, but we hide the cost of failure of the school district in the city of Texas. Why not let the, the Rochester City School District collect their own taxes so you can see how much it's costing for the failure? Let the people know. I bet once you see how much money goes down the drain, you're going to put a little pressure on that school board also. I want a truancy officer in every quadrant. About 30% of the kids aren't in school. You can't teach a kid that's not there. I'd like to see Saturday and summer academies. If they're in school, they're not committing a crime, they're not getting in trouble, and hopefully, we're keeping their attention focused on the ball. Of course, in 2009, I called for neighborhood schools. We spent $3.5 billion in today's dollars on busing. It obviously failed. I want to establish a real reform school. When there's kids that are acting up, you're stealing the education from the other kids. We may have to remove you for a while until you learn to act correctly. Then you can work your way back into your regular high school. 20 seconds. I want to premise mentoring programs. There is nothing that boosts a kid's confidence when he can point at something and say, I did that. These are just a few of the things that I have. There's 49 proposals on my website. Thank you. I think where we've lost in terms of education is for a lot of our youth, they don't even know why they're in school. Because they are not educated to be able to get out of school and then transition into employment. There was a time when public schools were initiated for that reason, was to prepare the workforce for jobs. But a young adult at this point in time can't even say when they graduate what they're prepared for. And that's what we need to change. We need to change the Attendance, but we also need to change the outcome of why they're there. We need to understand the why. Because if there's no why, there's no reason for them to go, and they have no purpose. And so part of that why is to have a system to prepare them for either college or for workforce, and I suggest that you do trades. I say the trades for one reason. There's a lot of jobs you can prepare for that disappear over time due to technology. But you're always going to need a carpenter, a plumber, an electrician, somebody in HVAC. And those are jobs in which when you get the skills, you can have a middle class lifestyle. Right now, 5% of our students are prepared for college when they leave high school. 5%. And we already know that only 47% graduate on time. So we need to change what our purpose is. And that's the role of the mayor to advocate, collaborate, and work with the city school district to have programs in place to achieve those goals. And there are some programs in the city school district that are doing a phenomenal job. 
You have your pre-tech program, Pathways to Technology at Edison Tech. You have your optics program at East High School. You have your uh, School of 58, which graduates almost 90% of their students as well as so. We need to repeat the programs in the schools that are successful so that we're preparing these kids for a future. And the future isn't just getting a diploma. Because in my day, many years ago, a diploma meant something. In today's day, it means nothing. And the why. 
Because the main thing about, from my perspective, of being a police officer, is why I did that job. And I think that job is serving to you. And I know there's a lot of dialogue in terms of how the police do the job, how they should do the job, and what you think of the job they do. My why was to save lives. Over my career, I've seen 1,500 murders in this city. And I'm going to say 90% of them were somebody who looked just like me. And I got tired of looking at those bodies laying in the street. I got tired of going and talking to those mothers saying, I'm sorry. That is my why. In terms of improving the police department, and we can always improve. I think number one is how we hire people. Because I believe the most important thing we should do is hire people who have the heart, the spirit of serving this community. Number two, how do we train them? We don't want to train them to be warriors. We don't want to train them to be occupiers of this community. We want them to train them to be public servants. Number three, how do you reward police? Because the rewards that you give help determine the service that you're going to get. And one of my things wasn't about rewarding people for making great arrests. My rewards were for things like shopping with a cop, going into a school and reading, taking the time to engage a young adult so that you can have a good relationship at a time as opposed to always on a bad relationship. Because sometimes we're the boogeyman. Somebody calls the police and we come and we arrest somebody, it's somebody's father, somebody's mother, and that's all that child sees is the police being a bad person. And so we need those positive engagements. And then finally, who do you promote? Because if you promote the wrong people, they're going to instill the wrong values of the people that serve underneath them. And so those are important things, I think, that can help change the culture of the police department. And I'll say this too. It's not a change that happens overnight. I don't care where you work. Culture change takes time. It's like taking a battleship and turning it. But you got to stay vigilant in the direction you want to go. And that would be my role as the mayor, to make sure that, that police department is going in the direction that it needs to go. Thank you. Very good. State your name? No, you can't. I'm going to get the job here. It's been a whole life. All right. My name is Lynchoy Johnson, and I am the mother of one of the victims of the boys and girls. I'm here tonight because I want to know what was sitting down and tell me. One life that was going to take it was just one team. And this city has seen one too many in this. My express wishes would be mine to see a little bit. That being said, here's my question. And I pose it first to the honorable mayor, lovely woman. I want to know what plans do you have to change the climate of the gun issues that are in our city? Number two, what laws that are already on the city books are you utilizing? Because there are laws regarding safe keeping of guns. We know that we're not used on a regular basis. And the last portion to that becomes this. What are you doing, each and every one of you, to strengthen the Safe Gun Act? Then we already know that many of our legislators, and if you don't know, many of our legislators are waiting and, and, and willfully working to tear apart because they don't want to have it. We need to know that there is something that each of you can bring to change what is happening to our children. And this is just my personal thought on this. There is no accident that these guns are finding their way into our neighborhoods, to our black children. And for many of us who are black that are sitting in this room, y'all take this any way you want. I have an indictment. You don't care, seemingly, when it's black on black, but we should. Because our children are dying in masses. My child was one of three that died, and there were three that were critically, had critical wounds 
on the night of the Boys and Girls Club shooting. For those who do not live in our community or are in the cultures, I say this to you. Your inability to rise with us, to do something about what we're all facing, shame on you. Because it won't be long before it visits you. And we're already beginning to see that on a nationwide level. So those are my three parts to my question. I still respectfully, I'm going to take my seat and listen to the each of you have to choose. Thank you. Thank you. As a mother, I can certainly sympathize with you, Ms. Johnson, and all the mothers and fathers of victims of violence in our community. I know that there are no words that I can say that will provide the comfort that you need. But the things that we have done to address the violence are unique and they're different. The first thing that we did was we recognized that there were many people that were utilizing the legal guns on our streets, that were going before different judges, that were getting out and getting different time. So I worked with the DA's office, the public defender's office, police department, as well as the 7th Judicial District to create a gun park in our judicial system. Rochester is the only city that has that. And from my understanding, it is working. But one thing about this court is not just about punitive measures, it's about trying to give people an opportunity to rehabilitate themselves. And so we have a program called Swiss Surgeon and Care, where you give individuals an opportunity to get support through community services, utilize those services, and if they do what they're supposed to do, then their sentence is then expunged or reduced. The other thing that we have done is work to with the Monroe County Clerk's Office. There was a time when people would pass away where they would have guns in the house. Family members didn't necessarily know that there were guns in the house or didn't check on those guns. And no one was notified of this is what's supposed to happen with this particular weapon that this particular owner has. So we're working directly with the clerk's office to get information when people die so that we can then talk to the family members to have them either turn his weapons in or put that gun on a legal permit. Another thing that we're doing, I know that uh, common legislator Ernest Flagler put forth and asked for more stringent gun storage laws and he had put that to a civil day to end, and I have supported that. I believe that that legislation is, is filed, and we're hopeful that we'll be able to come to fruition. And so, I know that I can't bring your son back or any victims of gun violence in our community, but I can tell you as your mayor, I have worked very, very hard to come up with innovative solutions to deal with any of the challenges. But for me, I don't want to see, I'm an attorney as well, I don't want to see people that look like us always in the judicial system. I don't. And I say that you have to hold people accountable for their actions when they commit a crime. But we want to put things in place so that they don't have to make those decisions. And so I've put forward programs like ANTA, Young Adult Manufacturing Training and Employment Program, Operation Transformation in Rochester, working with these community partners to train people in jobs so that they can make a different choice and a different decision. And I can tell you that I expended a whole lot of political capital with our union friends because they made a promise to me when I was on city council. I brought forth a project labor agreement, and I asked them, I said, if you, if we do this as a city, because the city never did this, and I'm going to take a little bit of time, because I wanted to make this point. 
If we do this, the county always did project labor agreements, the city never did. We want to make sure that people in our community are hired. People that need jobs are trained to be electricians, to be carpenters, to be uh, plumbers. And they promised that they would do that. And you know what? They got millions of dollars to do it. And when it came down to it, not many people got jobs. So the second time around, when it came time to do a project labor agreement, the board stopped it. And I supported them stopping it. Because my whole thing is that these schools that are being developed are being developed in our community. And therefore, the people that live here deserve an opportunity to work on it. And if you're not going to guarantee us, then you need, if I'm not going to guarantee you dollars. So it's a holistic approach that you have to have. One is to hold people accountable. The other is to put places, steps in place to train people. But the, uh, the last part about it is to make sure that we're educating the community about their responsibility when it comes down to guns. And as your mayor, I've done all three. Thank you. We are we are just about out of time. We are not going to be able to entertain all the questions inside um, because we only have approximately 25 minutes left, 18 of which long to the I will entertain this question here. Um, Mr. White briefly touched on a subject of concern uh, to me and the many others in our community. Um, who, who, my name is Reverend Wendell Dorsey. I have a two-fold question, and I'd like to address this to whoever feels most comfortable answering it. In the interest of time, I would ask that you direct it to a specific person. Uh, I would like to direct it to the um, I would like you to share with us what value and importance you place on our local taxi cab companies and our local taxi cab drivers. And the second part of the question is, how do you plan to address the negative impact that Uber and the will have in undermining taxi cab services. Thank you for the question. I believe we have to have a level playing field, and that's why today is seen in the news. I filed a complaint before the city ethics board about the city's relationship with Uber. Ride sharing came to Rochester. But the city still has an obligation to monitor how it is going. Because under state law, we can pull ride sharing, meaning Uber and Lyft, at any time. Therefore, it's inappropriate for the city to have a cozy relationship with a company that it could kick out at any time. And that's why we can't give city resources and allow former chiefs of staff to turn around and lobby the city on behalf of a company like Uber. The other problematic thing that happened with this situation at City Hall was that the city promoted this company and promoted these jobs. It's one thing to say, hey guys, we're having uh, this event that you can go to at a hotel downtown if you are very interested in applying for a position. That's how it happens. Not only do they use city resources and use the city as a billboard, the city put out language to potential drivers and people interested in saying, this is fun, it's a great way to make money. And we all know that Uber is a company that has a lot of problems. We all know that Uber is a company known for underpaying workers, known for uh, sexual harassment, known for a host of problems. Just because something is popular doesn't mean that you're allowed to disregard ethical conduct. And that's why I made my the ethics board, which was stacked with people who work for City Hall and donate to the mayor, did not find it in my favor, but did say that we have to revise the rules. I am the only candidate who has pledged not to take donations, to change city policy, and not to take donations from people with business before the city, people who want to do business with the city, or city employees. We have to clean up our political system. Your voices should matter a lot more.
more than corporations. Right now, that is just not the case. I believe we have to have a level playing field. And right now, we clearly do not have that. Thank you. Thank you. I would ask to extend the time. Um, are you all willing to ex extend the time 15 minutes? Yes, sir. Okay, we'll extend it until 8.45. Uh, 8.45. There are still some people who do have to go to work tomorrow. First of all, I want to thank everybody for coming. My question is directly to uh, Mr. Shepard. Uh, back in 2013, uh, my family went through something. Uh, we, we hear what you see about family, children. Uh, Dr. Walker spoke about uh, children getting abused. My daughter was in a situation where there was a fugitive that drove through a wall and was peeking in in a house. And all, all kinds of things were going on. I directly called you. You gotta ask the question, my brother. You gotta ask the question. What can we do to have a direct link to not only the police chief, but uh, the mayor, anybody else to uh, address certain things? Because once again, my family was addressed at the word of a future and police officers uh, Advocating evidence, and I reached out directly to you. You didn't call me back for days. Uh, you had to call me back here, uh -huh. but I was arrested two yeah. times. You know, within one week. But Not only me, but my daughter. And you never called us. Back. That's your question. My question is, what can be done? Is there another system that can be set up so that we can directly talk to the chief, the mayor, anybody that city council? I was told that it was in the hands of uh, the civilian review board, but nobody ever came back and talked to me to fix it. Nobody ever touched us. So what can be done to and maybe uh, add the victim into the equation and the process? Good name again? My name is Gordon. Okay, that's the question, Jim. Well, first of all, let me apologize that's the circumstance where you call my office and I cannot get back to you. I'll say to anybody in this room, my phone number is 474-226-0. I will have the same phone number until I don't have a phone. And so my point is, you call me direct. For me, it's very important to listen and to hear your complaints. For the three years that I was chief of police, every city council meeting, I would be there at 6.30 to 7.30 to listen to people talk. And a lot of times that talk was about the Rochester Police Department. And the reason I did that because I thought it was personal. It was required that I give them my ear to hear their complaints. If there was something that was an accolade, that's great too. But I thought it was very important for you to know that I was going to listen. 474-2260. I may not answer, but I will call you back. And, but, but beyond beyond that, I mean, as far as you, you, when you did your investigation, you found that everything was unsustainable. You, know, you couldn't find anything. But when I spoke with the, well, when the officer gave that position, they clearly, they clearly admitted to engaging in fabricating evidence. But you, on the other hand, when you did your investigation, you believe the officers of everything that we complain about. You, you found that you couldn't sustain anything against them. I mean, but you never spoke with me, my daughter, my granddaughter, none of these. If you're saying that they acknowledge that they did wrong, and they documented that, then I would have found them wrong. Which didn't. And you never talked up. So what can we do to uh, maybe Add the victim into this equation besides the civilian review board that, and PSS that, you know, do whatever they do. 
what, what I'm going to ask you to do is do a follow-up with Jim because right now we're talking about the candidacy for, for, for mayor. This is a side issue that I think definitely needs to be addressed, but this is the form four. Why is the mayor working with you? Well, as a mayor, he needs to be that. I think it's been an open answer to the question. Part of the process should include talking to the complainant or the victim or anybody who's involved. When I talk about completely thorough, that's what it means. You should talk to everybody that's involved in this scenario, whether they're a witness, whether they're a victim, whether it's a police officer, anybody who has some information to give, you go out and get it. That's completely thorough. So they're taking to the victims? Yes, and that's the circumstance that you're making a complaint, and I'm, I'm assuming that's what we're talking about. I think he's answered your question. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, morning. Morning, one. Good question. Um, so I heard you all say that you want to invest in our city schools and our students. Um, our graduation rates in the city are only at 45%, and a vast majority of those students are going home to households below the poverty line. If you look at districts 10, 15 minutes away, Pittsburgh, Fairport, Brighton, they have graduation rates in the upper 90s, and households below the poverty line are below the tents. There is a direct correlation in household income to a student's success rate in school. If you want your students to perform better and you want to have citizens in our community that are better people, they need to give them incentive to go to school. We need to give them households with money that can afford to give them a higher education. MCC shouldn't be something that's far out of every student's reach. How are you going to create viable jobs, not just training programs, for those parents who need to support their children going to school? I have to um, make it unequivocally clear that Ramon and David allocate one minute to each candidate. Rachel, I have my stopwatch. That's okay. Uh, that's okay. Uh, we, we have a 14% unemployment rate in the city of Rochester, and some neighborhoods is 40%. That's according to the U.S. Census, and it really hasn't changed much over time. We need a mayor who will fight for us, fight for our fair share of state aid, fight to bring jobs back into the city where people live on transit lines. I met a woman who takes the bus two hours to her retail job, low paying retail job in Henrietta on Jefferson Road, then walks from there to MCC on streets with no sidewalks. Rochester is not working for that young woman. We need a mayor who will advocate to bring jobs back to the city. How do we do that? One thing we can do is talk to Monroe County, talk to the state about not awarding tax breaks to companies that want to locate out of Bushnell's Basin. We have to stop celebrating when jobs go to Henrietta. This does not help our residents at all. And no one is having that conversation right now. I want to have that conversation. We need someone to fight for us here in the city. Thank you. Thank you. And I think you touched on a key point when we talk about education, which is the concentration of poverty in our city. And I'm a strong advocate also for a countywide school district. Why? So we can diversify not just the poverty, but the concentration of minorities that are in the city. We know that in a diversified district, which is diversified economically, racially, demographically, that gives children the best opportunity to be successful. And I believe that is part of our role. Will it happen tomorrow? No. But I believe we can start, and I'm an advocate for a regional magnet school. So we can set the tone, we can show success, and therefore people at the will, the intestinal fortitude, to replicate it. Thank you, Jeff. Tell me. Do you want to sell in a minute? Yes. Okay. We're allocating for one minute, please. Really, the real solution for poverty is a job. And it sounds so simple, but it is. Businesses left here because they sought out more conducive business environments. And when they leave, they take their jobs with them. This state lost 857,000 people in the past six years. We've lost people from the city, as Rachel has said. They're leaving for a reason, because regulatory reform is needed. I worked at General Motors for 25 years. I know how to put the parts together. I know how to set things up. One of the things I want to do is to call the Rochester Enterprise Zones, where fees are refunded after the first year. No taxes for second year, up to the second year. 50% third year, 75% the fourth year, and in the fifth year, they're back up to 100% tax like the rest of us. 
This allows them to keep some of their capital so they can expand their business and hire more people. Another thing that I would do is I would literally go to the Congress and advocate for something called a contact law. If you're going to make, if you want to sell it here, you're going to make it here, or you can't sell it. That'll work. So we all heard what the problem is, and I don't think that you've heard any solutions. I'm going to talk about what I have done. And when I tell you that we have wide Kiva, Rochester, because it's not just about someone becoming an employee. You want people to become entrepreneurs and have the opportunity to do so. And Kiva, Rochester has given many people that have been in their basement or outside of their car trunk the opportunity to, to get into a brick and mortar place and expand their business. Many of those businesses do not have access to the traditional financing market. So the first thing that we have to do is make sure that we give people the opportunity to be able to have access to capital, to expand their business, or to create a business. Because everybody doesn't want to be an employee. Those individuals that, and, and Kiva Rochester has done that, for those individuals that want to be employees, we're working directly with manufacturers to train people in what they need in order to get that job. That program has anybody that, many of the people that have went through that program and went through it successfully, all of them are working to be able to take care of themselves and their families. That's called the Young Adults Manufacturing Training and Employment Program. We have also done a program called OTR, which is a soft skills program to help people get the soft skills that they need so that they can become employees. But you hear about me doing job fairs at City Hall. And they talk about it as if the job fair was for me or for an employee at City Hall. No, the job fair was for the community. Because a lot of people in our community don't have access to computers. They don't understand the language. They needed somebody to be on site to help them with that. That was about providing hundreds of people with the opportunity to become entrepreneurs to drive the or for Lyft or to, or to become employed at Del Lago. I'm not going to apologize for giving people access to opportunity. That's what I believe that a mayor should do in fighting for a citizen giving them the ability to have access to opportunity. And that means working with private employers to get it done. Because I know that the best way to help children in our city is to make sure that their parents have access to a quality, good paying job. And I will do everything in my power to continue to do that. Uh, there's a lot of things we need to do. Uh, we have zoning codes at the moment that discriminate against local businesses and benefit our town businesses. We uh, do not allow home businesses to uh, thrive in many places in our city, so changing the zoning would be one of the easiest things we could do to help with that. The bigger, but this, we also have a huge shortage of capital as a result of the poverty. Many people want to start a business or have great ideas. They don't have the money. The city's going to have to be step in and provide the financial wherewithal to help out with that. We also spend about $80 million purchasing stuff every year, and the majority of that doesn't come from here. We need to create the businesses that produce the stuff we use in Rochester, using the people who live here to do the production. And only that way can we come up with sufficient jobs by create by seeding these businesses with our present purchasing and using the institutions that can't move anywhere, like nursing homes, hospitals, schools, to combine all of our purchasing together to create the businesses that will hire the people, which will encourage them to believe that schools will work. Thanks. Again, Lori. Thank you. Well. Once again, I'm the only candidate here who is willing to place a salary to my administrative salary, starting with my own, and then using that money to create jobs and um, positive programs for our, our young adults. Um, education is key. We need to increase entrepreneurship within the city. That's community co-op. Those are there's federal funding out there to support community co-ops. We need to begin to think as a community about supporting ourselves and not working for others. We need to think of a community that is um, addressing the technology and the, and the opportunities that are um, available in technology. 
so that our young men and women don't have to go into a job but can work from home. My son, um, he is sent all over the country um, and sometimes all over the world, but he can also work from home on his computer because he has those technology skills. So if we can get uh, our, excuse me, entrepreneurs um, that can work out of their home, they don't have to afford daycare. If we can get individuals owning their own home, they'll pay one third less than if they're paying rent to someone else who doesn't even live in this community. We can increase the tax base. Once we increase the tax base, we can take over our school district. Once we do that, we can provide our children with a proper education. One of the reasons our children are shooting each other is because they don't, they don't see an opportunity for life as an adult in our community. And we can change that through education. We can change that through entrepreneurship. We can change that through community co-ops. We can change that in our community by loving and teaching our adults to love themselves so that they can love their children. And it may seem like a pie in the sky uh, uh, goal, but it's totally achievable when we work together as a community. Thank you. that the family will get stronger, 
And the problem that I see is right now, and I look at this at like the schools that I've had contact with. People fail often for reasons that have nothing to do with education, that have everything to do with family. And unless we can help them solve those family problems, they're going to continue to fail. And so that's where I feel government should work to help the family and to help the parents with the things they need. Thank you. Hey, um, oh, man. I'm the government. I'm the government. I'm the government. There are other means other than government. I'm not asking government to go into a person's house and provide discipline and uh, teach kids to uh, go to school and study. That's not what I'm not asking government. I'm saying you hold parents. Hold parents to make sure that kids study, go to school, be obedient in school, do what they're supposed to do. Okay. okay, I think the question is, what way can they provide accountability? Yes. Uh, yes. And the same as the Don't. Now you know why back in 09 I said you need neighborhood schools, the neighborhood police precincts, to create that hub so they have a sense of belonging. I'm going to read this off, so I don't need to go too long here. I want a juicy officer for each quadrant of the city. You can't teach a child who's not there. If parents consistently fail to send their children to school, they should be charged with child neglect. Parents must be responsible, and if so charged, maybe go to parenting classes. I don't want to hurt you, but I want to educate you. I call this Give Kids a Chance program. Without their education, the odds greatly increase the child ends up involved in crime, in jail, stays in poverty, has children out of wedlock, and becomes dependent on drugs and alcohol, never becoming a contributing member of society, but a burden on society. In essence, throws his life away. If you really want to break the chains of crime, in the pipeline of prison, it gives a chance to program is key. I hope you enjoy that. And I think the key to what you're talking about is to reinstill the culture of education. Because that is what we're missing. And I think, particularly in the city, and for, particularly for people of minorities, we've lost that. We say the school district should educate our kids. And we should have a, a commitment that we have a role to educate our kids. I grew up in a large family, 12 kids. Neither parent had a high school education. But their advocacy for us, their command of us, was that we would go to school and we would do well. Very good. I, I would rather support parents than judge them. And that's why I, I judge them. I felt, you know, I, I, I don't want to be honest parents. You made the question. Have a seat, I please. Have a seat, please. I know, I, I know you don't want to be honest parents. Thank you. I don't have to take any more questions except these. Go ahead, Richard. I just don't think we should have the same philosophy on this one. But I, I want to support parents, and that's why I, I proposed adding 1,000 child care spots. The other night I met a woman who just got a job at next was the call center out of case, and she has five children, and she's so excited to have this job, but um, she has a huge problem with child care. And she said, no, it would be great if, if there was child care at this company. And I said, well, if I'm there, I'll pick up the phone and call Maximus, and maybe we can get a child care center there, that the Gates Town supervisor would join me. Finding those kinds of creative solutions to people's problems, them in any way that we can. That's something I'm very interested in. So I, I don't want to judge people or penalize them unless obviously they work the law, but I'm more interested in finding ways we can support them. Thank you, Rachel. Would you like to make a comment? Mm -hmm. I can just tell you what I'm going to happen. Um, I truly believe that um, we assume that people know how to be parents, and we assume that um, you can't do better if you don't know better. So one of the programs that we are funding through the children's agenda is a parent education course, where parents get together with, um, with leaders in the community, with other parents, and they um, learn about how to advocate for themselves, how to advocate for their children, how to get access to resources, but also how to be parents. And I think that that's one of the things that we sometimes take for granted because you have a child, you know how to be a parent and some parents don't. So we've been funding that program for a number of years and we will continue to do so. One of the other things that we have done is that's really what the Rochester Anti-Poverty Initiative is trying to do with the adult mentoring program. 
the adult mentoring program is meant to help parents um, get the support that they need in order to be more effective parents for their children. And so that's really about holding parents accountable, but we all make the assumption that they know better and therefore they can do better. Thank you, We're going to have our final question from Carrie Bowman, uh, after which we will have each candidate give their three minute uh, wrap up. Remind uh, Yes, my, my question is uh, directly to candidate Shepard. Right? When he was police chief, uh, statistically there was a report out by Barbara Blackwell and Ted Forsyth that shows the lack of commitment to the community by the police department, okay? Uh, in place, there was only 1% sustained, 2% sustained, okay? You was at, as police chief, a lot of that happened, all right? Now you're coming as an old candidate. What are you going to do that's going to change that issue with excessive force for police or with citizens, okay? We know what the problem is. There's two sides to every story, okay? But we have police officers that's in our community that's not being held accountable when they are violent towards our citizens. We've heard a couple of uh, people come up here and speak about incidents we have. I myself and my family have incidents where I was illegally put in prison. But you got to convince them okay. to the So what are you going to do as a as a leader? You get that chance when new civilian review board, accountability for uh, internal affairs for police officers, and in order to get the integrity started back again, you got to first have accountability. What do you got to say about that? Mr. Chairman. And I, th I think I said it earlier when we talked about how you hire, how you train, how you reward, how you promote. That's how you change the culture, and I think that's the key thing. In terms of the accountability piece, we know, we've heard, it's been discussed that there needs to be change. And I think being willing to have that dialogue and listen to the community and moving forward with that agenda is the only way we're going to put our officers and our community in a place where that trust exists. Let me say this. I'm the only one in this room who's investigated police, who found them guilty, who has terminated officers. Because when it is there, that is going to be the outcome. And there's going to be instances where you disagree. And there's going to be instances where the evidence doesn't support it. But when that evidence is there, when it's supported, the outcome should be with sustained fighting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You can't, no, we will go ahead and time. Uh, we're getting ready to uh, uh, have each uh, candidate wrap it up. We're going to start with a great show. No, uh, I'm giving the order. That's my order. We're going to start with Rachel. We're going to Jim. We're going to Tony. We're going to Alex, Lori, and then a lovely one. Thank you all so much for your thoughtful questions. I think we've covered a lot of ground tonight. What you've heard from our mayor is a smoke and mirrors campaign. She insists she created and retained 30,000 jobs. That's a lot. She insists that she made a PayPal error in her campaign account. That was a crime. She insists that her alphabet soup programs after program after program is changing our city. When we still have a 14% unemployment rate, those programs help very, very few people. Operation Transformation and five hundred applicants a year, only 40 people are still employed after six months. That's a program that's not working. You dig the leak beneath the surface, and you find a mayor who has real problems with the truth and hasn't done anything. She says the Uber job fair wasn't about herself. Yeah, it was. She made it about herself just now. Look at all this great stuff on you. The fact is, Uber didn't need her to create those jobs. They didn't need a mayor in another city for recruit workers. So it was about her. Lovely Warren wants to do the same things over and over and over again. Jim Shepard. I don't know what he wants to do. He has absolutely no idea and has admitted that. <laughs> we need a mayor who thinks big, who wants to help everyone, not just people in little programs. Our happy adult mentoring, $3 million, cut those 300 families a check. We know
know how events works. We need to be thinking about the benefits of We need to be thinking about big picture policies that help everyone and make Rochester a city that works for all. That's why I propose a citywide fiber internet network that would be free. That's why I propose lowering your property taxes. And that's why I want to add child care. And my opponents say, unrealistic, can't be done. Well, folks, you have the decisions to make. Is this all there is? We're just going to fight over the scraps that are left? I'm asking you to put your cynicism aside and think about what you want and what is possible and elect someone who is willing to try. Thank you. Anybody here ever been on an airplane? Yes. Well, I want you to imagine that you're getting on an airplane right now. I want you to put, pull up that seatbelt. Just that head seat, or that headrest. And then you get that intercom that comes on. This is your pilot. Bring your water parts. I've never flown a plane. I've never landed a plane. I've never taken off before. But I've read about it. That's what we're looking at here. Someone who's not demonstrating leadership. Someone who's not demonstrating the ability to collaborate, to work with others, to motivate, or inspire. Having written about it doesn't get you there. This is also a story about Anybody here a Clint Eastwood fan? The good, the bad, the other. The good is what Mary, Mary Lovely Warren has told you. The bad is the reality. The concentration of poverty over the last three years has gone up. Concentration of young adults in poverty has gone up. 52% of students in this city are living in poverty. I think about a story someone told me about a frog. You put a frog in cold water, and you turn on the stove, and as that temperature rises, they just sit there. And that's what's happening in this city. If you go back to the riots, 1964, unemployment for African Americans in the city was 16%. Right now, it's 18%. And we're steep. I don't want to be the mayor because I don't want to serve myself. And because I got a big ego. I want to serve you. And that's all I've done. We want to talk about my 10 years chief as three years of my life. But I've spent 38 years serving the city. And I'm sure you've got somebody that encountered Shepherd over those 38 years. And they're not going to tell you I lied to them. They're not going to tell you I stole from them. And they're not going to tell you I beat them. And Rachel has to make a point that guess what? Shepard says you punch him in the face, he's going to punch you in yours. That's the reality, folks. Thank you. Release your disciplinary record. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask that you uh, give way to the candidate. Well, folks, actually, I do fly aircraft. I fly over two aircraft, so I do have a little joke here. If you always do, what you always have done. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd love for you to give us some quiescence. You're going to always get what you've always got. All I'm asking all of you is to be fair. Look beyond my party affiliation, look beyond my skin color, look beyond my sex. And look at the 49 proposals that I've given you. Go on the website. And if you agree with 75% of it, I hit a home run. No one's come up and done the proposal that I've said of withholding mold to make this about it. No one's come up with that. Back in 09, I came up with going to put the schools back in the neighborhood. I came up with putting the police precincts back in the neighborhood. I've been doing this and studying this for decades. I'm the only one that's a union member for 41 years. I'm the only one that's worked with General Motors for 25 years. I rehab 2,000 properties. 
I, I change my own oil, I fix my own look, I do it all. I'm a regular guy. And that's why my slogan is, common sense from a common man. I didn't go to Harvard, I didn't go to Yale, but I've helped many solutions. Solutions that fix this city, not just manage a problem, but actually fix it. I'd like you to at least give me a fair shot and look at that. Like I say, you agree with 75%? I'm good. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Um, Alex, listening to you tonight ask your questions, they all seem to be about my neighborhood. We've got problems, you've got problems. You look, you've got kids running wild and standing on the corners, you've got vacant houses, poverty, well, poverty keeps going up no matter what we seem to do. And one of the things I want to remind you all is that we keep electing the same party with the same ideas to try to find a solution to what's going on. And they come in and they present the new wheel all over again. And it didn't work the first time, and it doesn't work the second time, and it doesn't work the third time. We have vacant houses, we have unemployed people. You'd think we'd be able to put that together. We have high utility costs, but yet we don't have enough effort to create a green economy. We have, we have transportation problems, and yet, we, we do not go after RGRTA to create solutions. And most of all, we keep spending our money and giving our money to other people. We have given away millions and millions of dollars of tax breaks. And we have given away every year almost $20 million in cash and ask yourself, why? The only answer I've been able to come up with in the last 30 years is because they're campaign donors, and they pay for the elect, they pay for the people who win, and then they get these benefits back. And it is making us poor. And the people up here who have the experience, some of them, uh, uh, they keep saying they have leadership, are fighting over these campaign donations because they want to be the one to get them and to give away the benefits. This is a lot of money. Ask yourself, is, is giving $60 million, or even just the $3 million in cash we gave Sigley's the right plan? Is building expensive senior housing for $3 million of our money the solution? Or are there better things this money could have been to? I represent those other things. I don't have all the solutions, but I know that with $3 million, we can do a lot better than create housing for rich people. And that's presently what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you.
community. My uncle Stanley owns a pit eye across the way. Yes. And we don't have positive outreach. We don't have positive outlets. Not only for our children, but for our adults. Rochester was great. Rochester can be great. Rochester will be great when you elect me as your mayor. Because I am willing to work with the people, not with the party. I'm concerned about what the people want, not the party. I'm an independent. I've always voted independent. Because I believe that we, the people of Rochester, can come together and form a better city for one another. There are solutions to all the problems that we talk about. And those solutions are a community that works together for each other. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Desperate politicians that are telling you and saying things that they want. Because they want your vote. They want you to vote for them. You remember last year we had a desperate politician to do that and now he's president and you see what's going on. So I will tell you all, don't be trumped. The fact of the matter is that all these people over here talked about all the things about me, but nothing about you. Nothing about what you want to see. Right. Nothing about how we can make this city better. Right. The fact of the matter is that as your mayor, in the last three and a half years, I'm the only one up here that has a record. The only one up here that has a record for fighting for you. That's right. Some of us up here are elected, and they've done nothing as legislators. And they can't tell me that as a legislator you can't do this. Because when I was the president of the city council, I forced the administration to recruit more officers of color, more officers and firefighters of color. I forced the administration to do things to put people to work as a legislator. So I ask you all to pay attention to what they're doing for you right now. What legislation have they put forth? None. But as mayor, let me tell you what I've done. We talk about transportation issues. Not only have I made a contract to spend taxpayer dollars with V-Ride to make sure that people get transportation to and from work, today we announced the largest bike-sharing program in the country for a city of our size. We talk about, and we talk about, we talk about different transportation options because we know that the best way that we can help children is to make sure that their parents have access to quality, good-paying jobs. And to do that, yes, I work with private companies because I understand that the private companies are the ones that have the jobs, and we want our residents to have them. And so I will continue to fight to make sure that our residents get jobs. I will do programs like ANTEP and OTR and other things to train people to get those jobs. Because you know what? When you listen to business owners, the one thing that they say to you, the one thing that they say to you, is that people don't have the skills. So what do I want to do? I want to remove the excuse. You give them the skills, you give them the training, so that they can then get the job. That's what you do as a mayor. And when I talk about crime and opportunity, and what we've done with the police department, we've been able to hire more African Americans, more Latinos, more women in our police department than ever before, year after year, because you know what I made it a priority. You think about buildings in this city, in areas that have never had buildings in this city, it had housing built in over 30 years. On Hudson Avenue, there's a new housing development going on. On East Main Street, there's a new housing development. Neither one of those areas had development going on in 30 years. I made it a priority. I also just purchased, and will be purchasing Bull's Head so that we can there bring in a development for this community here on the west side. So what I'm talking about, I'm just talking the desperate politicians. They're telling you stuff to try to get your vote. Ask them, what are you doing for me right now? And what have they done? And I will tell you nothing. 
As your mayor in the last three and a half years, I have kept you at the forefront of everything that I have done. Twenty seconds. Keep you at the forefront if you elect me for another four years. We will change the city and we will change the city together. Thank you. 